Okay, good morning, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about the receipts and refunds and a little bit about the accounts receivable module, just so you have an overview of what it looks like for when some of your districts may use it. <clears throat> so we'll start with the receipt process. And the receipt process is where the user records or posts the monies received for the district and the transaction gets posted to a revenue account. So let me go into a demo instance. We'll go to the revenue account. Amanda went over this yesterday too, or the first day, different views of the accounts. So it's a five code for the system, but the receipt code is four digits here. And I'm just pulling up like 006, so there's fewer on the screen. And to show you that it's, you can filter just on the top row. So these receipt codes are defined by the Auditor of State or AOS. And it's by like the receipt source and the purpose. Oh, uh, see, I had uh, this right to the page earlier. I Anyway, so there's a code for like um, cafeteria. Of course, I'm flustered. Anyway, sometimes the receipt code has a code for transportation. Sometimes it the purpose is for cafeteria. Here you can see support services and so forth. So, it defines the receipt source and purpose. And remember, Amanda talked on the first day that the accounts have like a transaction indicator, TI. You notice you don't see that on the screen anywhere. It's kind of behind the scenes so that when you report to the state, it includes that. Um, and a receipt for revenue accounts, the TI or trans transaction indicator is an O3. Something else I didn't uh, point out yesterday that could be on the expenditure account is also on the revenue account and it's these XREF codes. These FREF, XREF codes are like a cross-reference. And it, so this breakfast code is tied to this account. So, oh, and then just one note, if you have a XREF code of bus and you have it, I don't have it, but I'm showing you on the screen. If it's capital letters BUS, it's got to be used as capital letters BUS. It won't recognize the different um, capitaliz capitalization. But these are handy when, for instance, the district um, doesn't share the accounts or the secretary doesn't know all the accounts, like at the secretary, like at the high school but they're submitting receipts to your the treasurer's office like on a spreadsheet. They don't need to know the accounts. If it's for breakfast, and this is a very simple um, example. I'm not sure if this is the right account. I'm just showing you that this breakfast XREF and a la carte and milk is tied to that account. So later when I show you how receipts can be imported, that high school secretary can enter breakfast and then submit that spreadsheet to the treasurer's office. The treasurer's office can import that spreadsheet and it'll post it to that account. So that's kind of sweet. And again, there's some on the expenditure account too. And I know I tried to do it when I was creating a requisition and it didn't work. And that's because I didn't have it tied to the account. So let's go back to the revenue. How do you find those XREF codes? Because you know, without a filter, it's all the accounts. You can like hit the top row so it goes um, 
an ascending order and like that. But you can also, I set up my advanced query. Again, I love this little advanced query. For those who probably used uh, Classic, it was probably similar to EIEIO, where you could just filter down to the details. Um, I save this as XREFs. And what I did was find the XREF code over here, drag it over, equals not null. So it's not going to be empty, true. So then when I apply it, they show. And again, you can print out a report if you would like to. So that's kind of handy. And that actually can, that report could be given to the high school secretary, you know, for the codes or whatever. All right, so regarding receipts, again, that can be, um, the processing can have so many different variables again, around, you know, for different districts. Again, the user roles, the account filters on the user, which I kind of reviewed yesterday when we were talking about requisitions and the rules of the district. So the rules for receipts, these, I just have it already on the non-mandatory rules. So these rules could vary from district to district, but um, requires active accounts on receipts, warning when posting a receipt. And I do believe that there was one excuse me, one custom rule, require an amount on a receipt item. So again, I believe I showed you how to um, import a rule yesterday. And, but these non-mandatory rules and these custom rules, of course, affect receipt processing. But this receipt grid under the transaction menu, also performs a reduction of expenditure. So on this menu, when you create, um, you can have a receipt transaction on this, as well as a reduction of expenditure just by having separate lines. Um, the ex reduction of expenditure is, exactly that. It reduces the cost that was posted for the expenditure by posting it through the receipt. One of the examples that I know of um, is like when you get your foundation payment from the state. And again, this is not sure if these are accounts are correct or the wording, but you get your revenues in and you see the RC code is for the receipt. And you post your revenue. Well, on their statement that they get from the state, some districts uh, through their foundation payment gets their retirement, which I believe is the 14% taken right out of their foundation payment. So that's a reduction of expenditure because you, you want to post that. Nor, um, if you weren't getting it deducted out of your foundation payment, you would be posting it as an expenditure. But since it's coming out of what monies you are getting, you're posting the receipt and um, reducing the expenditure by the retirement 14%. I just got to notice that my PC is running slow, so I hope it's not acting up on your end. So any questions on that? That's one of the examples of putting both a receipt and a reduction of expenditure on the same receipt. And here you see a standard grid with your my favorite button and a report button and more button to bring in any other things that you may want. But let's go into create. Here's that import button which I'll show in a minute. And you notice this is grayed out until you select one or more. 
But first, we're going to create one and talk about the fields. The receipt number you can leave. Um, you can leave blank to uh, have it auto populate. Again, that is configured under that transaction configuration. And I showed you yesterday an example of how to set one of those transaction configurations to the highest number by using the example of setting it on the vendor. So the same concept could be used to set your receipt number to auto populate to the next one up to that highest number. You can also enter whatever you want, you know, as it could be entered or auto populated. The date's going to be um, defaulted to the current date, but it must be in an open period. I think I just got kicked off, didn't I? Yeah, it was brief, though. Uh, so we aren't seeing your screen. Okay, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> I got to check to see if I'm recording, which I doubt I am. What I think it still one. is. Oh, you do? Okay, good. Yeah, it is. We're good. Thank you. So the date. <laughs> it It'll populate to the um, current date. It's got to be in an open posting period like any transaction. You can enter, receive from, and I'm going to say the high school office. The description can be up to um, 3,000 characters. So you can put as much information and description as your treasurer wants. I'm going to put um, cafe sales. These gray boxes are grayed out, but will populate as you create your lines. So line one, we're going to do milk sales. This is a drop down for your receipt code or your reduction of expenditure. Right now we're going to post sales. So that would be... Um, A, a receipt. This is where if you're, if the secretary or whoever's entering the receipt wants to use that XREP code that I showed you, they could just type in milk and it goes right to the code. How sweet is that? And you accept. Now, another thing you could do, I'm going to just add another line and put um, a la carte because I think that was another XREP. You can search for your account here and it brings it up. And again, I think you can just do, but I'm not sure if one of those are capitalized. Oh, I'm not even an X ref, sorry. We'll try the milk because I, oh, there we go. It did, I just have to be patient. So there's your milk. But if you don't know your XREF, again, you can search up here and they all come up. And remember, if the user, I'm logged in as an admin. If I was logged in with a user with an account filter that just can view certain accounts, that's all they would see here when they search. So we're going to try that a la carte again. So now that I got a couple lines. Um, I want to show you that I can move these lines. And again, you see the tool tips move up so I could put a la carte first if I wanted these alphabetical. I can move them down. This uh, adds a line just like this one did. 
So if I wanted a fourth line. And this copies. So if I wanted two a la carte, so this could be junior high and this could be high school, you can do so. So I'm going to save this. I'm thinking I have a rule that says it must have an account. I do. Um, I'm not off the top of my head. I'm not sure if that's a custom rule or uh, a rule that you can enable, but to see the rules, you would go under system rules. Um, so to view that receipt, once you, again, you can click here to print. You can actually just print from here. But to, when you hit edit or view, you have the ability to edit, clone, and reverse. So let's talk about edit. When you click on edit, again, it's got to be in an open period to um, edit a transaction because you're changing the transaction. And when you're changing a transaction, you want your like month end figures and reports to be updated. So when you have that posting period open, when the posting period is closed, all those changes that you're editing are updated on reports and accounts. And that's the reason. So when you edit, you can edit the receipt number. If you don't like that, there is a rule that can prevent that. Um, so if the rule was enabled, you wouldn't be able to change that receipt number on an edit. You can change the date, you can change the items and whatever you need and then click save. If you wanted to clone this because it's the same order for uh, April, you can do so, but you can also like get it rid of this line. So after you clone it, you can still edit it to be what you really want. This month, we're going to have more pop sales, you know, such as that. And again, the new cloned receipt is going to auto populate in this instance because I'm leaving it blank. So I might not need that and decide to reverse a receipt. And a reverse receipt is just exactly what it says. It reverses everything. So let's hit reverse. It does come up with a user option to choose the reverse date, say if I wanted to really put it tomorrow. I have a chance to go back and change my mind or generate the reverse receipt. And I'm just gonna generate it to show you what it is. So this pops up and you can see everyone that we had is just reversed to the same accounts. Notice I still have these buttons and I am able to, this is the original, this is the reversal. I have the ability to still edit this. So maybe I don't want to reverse this one. I I can delete it and it would only reverse certain charges. I can't think off the top of an off at the top of my head for an example of this, but to know that you can do a reversal and edit the reversal is good to know. And again, these buttons, notice I haven't check marked any so this pop up stays until I click here. If I do that and click save, a new receipt would pop up. If I had that clicked, it would have closed it. So let's see. That reversal. Notice the description here, but let me pull it up and I'll show you. 
it does denote the reversal of the original receipt in the description. So that's kind of nice. And notice these were populated after the items were created. And if you wanted to print the original, you can do it here or there. You have the option of two formats. Actually, you have more options. You can do the XML for other ways of printing. Um, and then if you choose PDF, you also have the option of choosing a custom form. And I have two custom forms here, one with the receipt of a logo. And I thought, I don't have that up anymore, but I'll show you a receipt that I, um, with this logo. And then somebody put in a ticket to have this be created for the reduction of a expenditure. So I'll show you that too. So first, a receipt. And I just put a simple logo on my receipt and a generic one at that. So right there. Versus, let me show you the regular one, the default. I'm not sure if it's just the logo. So there's the default of the same receipt. Here's the logo. So it's a little bit formatted. Um, so since uh, receipts and reduction of expenditures are both on this grid. You really can't tell which is which without like reading or so again, I set up a handy dandy advance query and I load it in for RX transactions. So this it's, um, it's the type, which is the RC or the RX. So I drug that over the property from here to there equals RX. And as soon as I hit apply my transactions load. Now notice the ODE payment showed up because it has at least a couple lines on there. But I'm going to check one for, I think it was this one that I was, So this one is a reduction of an expenditure. I'm going to print it and show you that custom. So just know that that's available on any PDF form that you're able to customize your forms. So I just have a generic reduction of expenditure. Not sure if everybody prints these out, but it's possible to have a custom form. So, I have this receipt in my notes and I'm not really recalling why I was gonna show you this one. Oh, I already showed you how it can be used in the same receipt the type of uh, transaction as a receipt or a reduction of our expenditure on the same uh, receipt. All right, so since we have time, I'm gonna show you how to import the receipts. First, I'm gonna go to the PowerPoint because it's, colorful and denotes what I'm going to talk about. I am going to leave in my spreadsheet this blank so that it auto populates. Notice I can also import uh, both types, RC and reduction of expenditure. I don't need a full account. The secretary can enter the XREF codes, but it's got to be the exact 
Actually, I'm not sure if that's true anymore because I think I did a small M. So, but the, the XREF isn't there. And then when it's imported, it'll pull the correct account. That's what's important. Um, and the reduction of expenditure, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but you're reducing an expenditure. So of course you're gonna use an expenditure account. So when you're entering that receipt and you're choosing the Rx, it's gonna only show you the expenditure accounts. So when you're importing it, you're doing the same thing and you receive from and the description. So we're gonna take this. Oh, I was gonna show you one more thing. I guess it's not on here, but if I had, if these two lines were the same and this was a two, then it would be a two line receipt. But I don't have an example. These are all one line receipts that I'm gonna end up importing. So I hope I can find this file this morning. All right. And in the documentation, there is the criteria for the spreadsheet. Actually, let me, well, I showed you the spreadsheet. Um, and it gives you the sample template. So it's all there. So once I in, choose my file and load it, it should give me the results here that eight records, eight receipts loaded. If it didn't, it would be noted on this USAS load error report, but mine's gonna say the same thing as this did. So here's the setup that is in the, um, that was on my Excel, but formatted for a uh, CSV. And this is what's in the manual under the receipt chapter. So let's go to, the unfiltered grid. And I honestly forget what we were importing. Some milk received from snatch. Okay. On three seven. So on this one, I don't think I talked about this. On the spreadsheet, when you have commas in a CSV file, it's going to take that. And I believe this one too, because it was a special character with cafe with that slash, whatever that's called. But with the comma, it's going to wrap it around with quotations. So see this, it's a different wording, but it's the same example because of the commas, when it imports, it's gonna do that. So those got imported successfully. Any examples on, or any questions on that? All right, let's see. The reports that you can use besides like narrowing down further on this grid for like maybe donations, applying your query, you can create a report from the grid or whatever results that you have on the grid, even if you don't use the my favorite button. Um, you can do it from here too, on any grid through the system. But another um, report are under the template reports. SSDT receipt ledger report. There's a SSDT receipt listing report. And 
There's those two. And then there's a reduction of expenditure ledger report. And then under your help button, you can find that documentation, but you can also find other created shared report definitions and examples, which can be downloaded into your district and be utilized. Uh, one of them that I know is on here, it's kind of sorted by account-based reports, like a budget summary, budget reports, transactions, which is what we were looking for. So you have options to sort by fund in the special cost. So it would look like this if you wanted to. I believe if I click this, it'll go to the next view option. Nope. But you have options, the districts have options. They can uh, download this and have different types. Notice these are by the type. So you're not limited to what's in here. As you know, you can also customize your reports. Amanda talked about accounts on the first day. So remember the receipts actually increase the amounts on the revenue accounts because you're receiving the amounts. A reduction of expenditure is going to open up these funds on the expenditure account. Um, not open it up. They're going to post that expenditure on that expenditure account. Like my example for the ODE receipt that reduces the expenditure by that retirement expense. So any questions on receipts? Next, we're gonna talk about refunds. And I know when I worked for a school, we did a lot of refunds to parents for library or whatever, late fees. So I know we have some of those examples in here. But a refund is that, is a money being returned from a parent or a receipt that was already receipted into the system. So the parent or the receipt says 100, but they really only owed 50, so you're gonna refund the other 50. So to do that in USAS, again, there's a lot of variables, um, account filters, the user roles, and the district rules. By default, um, the vendor that you're using on the refund, must be active. However, there is a customizable rule that can be utilized and it doesn't have to be an active vendor. So again, you can leave, you can enter this or have it auto populate by that uh, tr transaction configuration setup. I'm gonna leave it blank so it auto-populates. That's the date's gonna to default to uh, today's date, which happens to be in an open and current posting period. I'm gonna re refund it to Doug. And the description is library fees. This is going to auto populate if this refund is ever voided, but I can't check on it. So it's not a field that the user would be filling out. Neither is this. That's going to auto populate. Same with the created date. Now, if I owe Doug Fox for the library fees and I want to send him a check, I would hit this. And then these fields open up once I click on the open up to be entered and you enter your check date. You can choose your bank and choose your vendor, whoever it is. And then your items. I think I said 50, but oh well. So, and I just picked an account. So then 
again, I'm going to close this, save it, and it's going to close the window. Now that created the, um, the refund, which if I print, I'll show you what it looks like. Oh, I do have a refund custom form. I didn't think I did. Just to show you the variables. So this is the custom refund where the tre treasure of this party, but it's really, it's not the check. And, but you wanted a check. So where you have to do is go under disbursements because whether it's an accounts payable, a payroll or a refund, it's a check or a disbursement. You can see the type here is noted as refund and printed as false. So if I wanted to print, I generate my print file. I would click electronic if it happens to be an electronic vendor. I'm going to do a PDF form, but you know what a check looks like. So I will open that up. And now you have a refund check to that Doug Fox, even though I didn't have a vendor set up for Doug Fox. So it's noted as BGSU. Hopefully that's not confusing. So now you have that refund. If we go back to the refund grid, the check number can be pulled into this grid, noting the check number. When you view it and go to, you have the ability to edit and clone. When you edit, only the edible fields will show. So like the date, again, it has to be in an open posting period. I might want to update the, this to be high school. Um, I might want to capitalize that, but the other fields are not um, editable. And then I can click save and it'll save that high school afterwards. Again, I can clone it and that just copies it and it's still editable. Even on a clone. And I did show you how to print to delete. Um, a refund without a check let's go back to the disbursements that check that we created for that refund for BGSU if you need to delete or reverse the refund, you would void the disbursement. And by voiding the disbursement, it reverses the refund. So this was my $10 check. I would void the disbursement. It's given me that confirmation. And now when I go back to the refund grid for that $10 BGSU, that's when it populated on the original um, refund that now it is voided. If I had a refund, that I created without a check. I just would leave that blank.
I would be able to delete it because it's not tied to a check. So if, if the refund has a check, you have to go and void the check. If the refund is just an internal refund, um, you can void it from the screen. Again, as long as it's in an open posting period. And since I just did it, today's an open posting period. So I just deleted that. Also, the difference between those two, whether one has a check or not, I have an example in the PowerPoint. So two refunds were processed. This top one created a refund with a check and it is, when it was reversed, it is denoted on the revenue account. When it is a refund, the $70 here, and it's deleted, it's just deleted because there's, it's just a, it's, it records the disbursement and just reverses the refund, if that makes sense. Any questions on that? Kind of like the receipt grid, how do you find your refunds on a disbursement grid? You could filter by the type, like right on the grid to pull up all your refunds. You could set up an advanced query, which I don't think I have, but you could. There's probably not that many refunds. Well, I guess we have a lot. Another place you can go is to run reports like the disbursement detail report and denote it as just the refund if you wanted to and run that. We do have the outstanding disbursement report template that you can run to showing the outstanding disbursements for refunds if you needed to. So those are some of the reports that you can run that you can choose refunds on. Any questions on that? All right, so accounts receivable. I just wanted to review this so not everybody's going to use this, but so you're familiar with maybe the menu options for some of the districts that you support that may be using this. And what is it all about? It is a separate module that you would end up turning on, but it's used to record billings and recording payments. And then you can, it's like a separate tracking for billings and payments, but you can tie those payments into a receipt under the disbursement grid, like I showed you earlier. So I'll show you how that all relates. And how is it used? One example that comes to my mind is like ESCs that invoice the districts for their services, whether it's psychologist services, counselor services, whatever services that ESCs provide, they bill for those and they can use this module to keep track of their billings, um, their payments, provide a customer statement, generate an accounts receivable report. And again, if they post a payment, they have the ability to turn it into a receipt under here. So, although it's a separate module too, when you're customer, when you're starting, you have two types of customers. You can create a vendor customer, like you pay in accounts payable, like this was a vendor under accounts payable. So you can pull that in, like my Tarda. Um, I think there was the BGSU. 
So you can create your AR customer from your vendors that were already set up, or you create a new one. And it looks like a vendor screen. Um, your information. Here you have options, customer. You can denote it as an employee for like mileage. You can set it up as a student. You have email, address, phone number, and so forth. Either way, they're an AR customer, but there's the vendor customer. It just added the ability to pull all that information in. Like I will do the Tarda. And if you leave that blank, it would automatically populate. See how it populates it from the, the other screen, from the core vendor. Ledger codes are also set up. These are like defining a billing category. And I have a very simple example here, the category of bus or transportation, cafe and high school. I would be doing uh, field trips. I might have to do billing for that. A high school might be billing for um, custodial services and so forth. The payment location, it depends on where they're, I have two set up here. So it is noted where the payment would go to, whether it's to the cafe or to the main office. And to start, the district would create the billing. So let's create a billing and I'll walk you through what we see. So this is where those codes come into play. I'm gonna pick the transportation department code. The next, this is auto-populated. The date defaults to today. The customer, I'm gonna pick the Catholic school because we're providing transportation services. Location can just default to the main office. I have the option of choosing a due date if I want. So let's just pick April 1st. I have a big screen, so I have to scroll down to find that add button. But this is where I would add my details. So the service date It's for the month of February in my case. So I'm just gonna put the last day of the month, bus services. Oops. This will auto-populate and your accounts will be there to choose. Save, and I'm gonna close it upon save. So there's my billing. Once I click on this and it catches up with me, these appear, so let me do that again. They're grayed out, but once I click on that billing, I have the ability to apply payments, print, or email that bill. So you would do from who, from who you're sending the bill to, carbon copy to my own, and then send. Of course, there's a little bit more configuration in order to make sure those emails set, but I'm just giving you the overview of how it works. So notice you can import your bills too. And in the documentation, you would have that template spreadsheet and the criteria. You can print. Let me show you what that looks like. And I do have a custom billing with the logo. This particular ITC requested it to say invoice. Oh, you know what? I have this saved. So this is the default PDF. And this is the custom one. So we created this one because they wanted the word invoice on here with their logo. It's the same information. But see how nice it is, how you can just customize it to your district's 
or the district can customize it. All right. Um, you can also apply payments here. You can do it here. You can do it under the menu payments. But either way, whether I clicked on um, apply payments or this, it opens it up to this. And you would apply it to the date. You can enter your check number that they submitted. We're going to do I was thinking I was yeah. So the check, even though the billing is 2500 they goofed in their department at the school, at the Catholic school and sent in a hundred dollars more. So I'm gonna apply that payment. Notice this, if I wanna generate a receipt to be under transaction receipt, I can do that. That's gonna default. Notice when we came in here that I didn't have to check mark that, that's gonna default. So I do wanna, receipt printed. I'm going to post it for $100 more and click save. I mean, you do want to accurately post what you receive. However, now, oops, let's go into that billing. Now it's in the uh, status of a credit. So you see the total items was 25, total paid 100. And I'm sure there's a column under the more button that says the credit. But let's look at the billing. Once you look at the billing and you edit it, you, well, you can see it's total paid and you want to edit it. Hey, wait a second. If that created a credit, so let's go under the credits. If you want to refund this credit of $100, Catholic school, I can click that and refund the credit. This is going to create a disbursement. You want to re uh, credit the revenue account that it came from. Choose your vendor, and I'm just picking any. You have the chance to revert back to this grid and not do it or refund the credit. Once we do that, you would need to go to the disbursement grid and prepare that credit or the check, the disbursement. The other way that you can do you can apply the credit to, I have an example, let me. This little button, you can manage. If I did not refund that credit, it would show up uh, as a in fact. I'm just gonna go back to the disbursement grid and get rid of that credit so that I can show you properly.
I'm sorry. Let's create a billing and I'll just start over and show you. I, I used my example and so we'll just create a simple billing. Pick a customer, a location. For $100. They're going to pay okay i did that the last time so i'm going to go under for the purpose of showing you you can also apply it here so it's billing one zero three two create that's just another way of doing it but like i said it has the same screen and they paid 200, $100 more. I can print the receipt from here if I wanted to. But now when I look at the billing, I can manage those credits and apply it if there's another invoice. And that's what I should have done. Let's clone this so there's another one. All right, so this is the original one that they overpaid. They paid uh, 200. The invoice was a hundred. If I go here, you can see you have a hundred dollar credit. So what you would do is the new bill or the new, the other open invoice, you can apply that credit to this other open invoice. You now have this or this available. So let's go to here first. You would only see that populated dark if there's a credit available. Okay, so that wasn't gonna pop up. This one would have popped up. So here you can see you're managing it. If you wanted to delete it, you can. You can also apply it. So now this $500 bill, I go back to the, the $100 or the $500 bill is only going to be 400 Remaining amount is 400 so then the secretary, when the $400 does come in from that vendor, they would apply and only have 400 to apply. Credits are kind of funny because you can, you can apply it to the open invoice or the open billing because I had two, I had two billings open for that St. Mary's. So the one that was overpaid, I applied to the other one, or you can prepare that refund credit. So it reflects on the grid to $100 applied credit. Now accounts receivable also has that AR ledger query, which is similar to your, um, the, uh, activity ledger query under the transaction. So here you can advance query, you can pull more into this grid, but you see here that it shows the billing, the receipts all on one grid. So you can get much more filtering on this grid than you can on individual like billing grids or whatever. Uh, 
Okay, so if you need to correct a payment that is tied to a receipt, you just can't go to the payment and delete it here because it's tied to the receipt. So this is payment 1030. You would go to the receipt grid. Oops. You would go to the receipt grid first to delete that receipt. So 1030 was the payment. Once I delete it from the receipt grid, and that's because I when I created that payment, that little check mark was to generate a receipt. So once I delete the receipt, that payment is no longer tied and it's now deletable. And I believe we have that in the FAQs. In the FAQs, there's some accounts receivable uh, questions. And actually, let me just point this out. This FAQ is segregated into topics. So like I said, the accounts receivable has a couple of help topics about applying the payment in the credit. And then the, the last thing I wanted to show you is the reports. We have the billing detail, the billing summary, AR billing detail, AR billing summary, the detail report, and the AR transaction report. I'm not sure if I talked about this, but you can tag these, any of these, oops. So that you can pull your reports on the grid and see what all that you have for the AR. Another option is under the canned reports, the cust oh. Customer statement in the accounts receivable report, right under the accounts receivable menu. So I guess I have that wrong in the PowerPoint and I apologize. I put these two reports under the canned reports found under reports. So I'll correct that in the PowerPoint, but it's these two, it's on, I don't know what slide, let me see. 116, these two, it's this statement that's wrong. Those are actually found under the AR menu. And that is all I have today. Any questions on receipts, refunds, AR, or anything that we covered in the last three days? All right. Well, you have a good day. Thank you for joining us. We'll put this recording out on our page and have a great day. Hopefully we'll see you some of you guys next week at the OECN United Conference. Thank you.